Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that my fellow co-chair has had to step down from her role, Gorenka Vuklic, as co-chair, um, but she will still be with us as past chair. And we are in the process of um, identifying or, or appointing somebody to hold the role temporarily until we can go through our actual process to get a new co-chair. Um, but wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. And I just need to find my notes here to, there I am. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, it's been a, just a great morning. Um, lots of great discussions. And, you know, this um, title that we've given our, our forum this year, Coming Together in Changing Times, I think is really suitably fitting um, as we work through a number of things going on in the world around us. And we think about our um, youngest citizens and how do we do better to ensure that um, the children and the youth are well. Um, so we're now into the second half of our virtual day. Um, and if you weren't here this morning, I would like to welcome you to the event. Um, now, before we launch into our, our um, next step of this conversation, I did want to bring us back to our territorial acknowledgement. And as I think about children, I did mention this this morning, but when I, I do think about um, children, oh, I'm sorry, um, and the, the, the work that I, my own personal work around learning about Indigenous ways of knowing and being, and, you know, I've talked about this before, but where children and youth are seen in, in most of the reading that I've done the, <clears throat> is that the view of the child is that of being sacred. And I think that is such an important consideration as we do this work that if we pause and really consider our youngest um, citizens as sacred, how does that shift and change the work that we do? And when we think of belonging, what does that really mean? And then, and then I think about how really, and if a child is sacred, is not all humanity sacred? And should we be considering that about each other as human lives who um, have roles to play on this earth and who deserve to have a sense of belonging? With that in mind, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that we are gathered today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Chinonkton people. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land, their achievements, and their contributions to our community. We offer this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. So just a couple of logistics um, before I move forward. And I would like to just remind you to please mute yourself, rename yourself with your name and your organization if you have one, and tag us and share about your forum experience on social media as well. And I would like to extend a special welcome before we, um, sorry, sorry, Allison, <laughs> before we announce our speaker, but I'd like to say a special welcome and introduction of uh, Chair Karen Redman, who has joined us here today. Karen is, uh, Chair Redman is an actual, absolute champion of work related to children and youth. Um, really pleased to have you here with us and Chair, Car sorry, Chair Redman, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words before we get started. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. And I always answer to Karen. You don't have to keep calling me chair. Okay. <laughs> I, I just want to tell you how pleased I am to be with you this afternoon. The annual forum is a great opportunity for CYPT members and those in our community who are passionate about children and youth and well, their well-being to come together to plan, learn alongside each other. You know, as you may know, the theme, as Barb already mentioned, is coming together and changing times. And I think we would all agree that these are certainly changing times. And of course, we're facing some hard realities in our own community and across the globe. We can see continued impacts of the pandemic. More people in our community need a place to call home and we've seen a rise in hate. But we can also see much positive and inspiring changes all around us. More youth than ever before are involved in our community through CYPT initiatives. We see Waterloo Region youth creating innovative solutions to the world's challenges. And we see all of you 
working to support children and new youth in the new and important ways. CYPT is one of our community's best examples of defer, diverse pan regional effort to come together to work towards greater children and youth well being. It is essential infrastructure to advancing the community that values, who listens to, and who includes young people. It is all due to the efforts of the members around this table that that is happening. It's fabulous to see how CYPT continues to grow. I understand that young people connected to the work of CYPT now outnumber the adults, an important milestone that shows the impact youth are having right across our community. CYPT's focus on innovation is leading the way in so many ways, with paid roles for young people on staff teams, developing new coaching programs, and a new role for looking at meaningful child engagement. You're always looking at new ways to deliver services equitably and services that are sustainable. I also understand that the membership of CYPT has never been higher with more grassroots organizations and new partners joining our efforts every year. We all know that the work of this collective is deeply important now and continues to be so as our community will grow to a million people, people by 2050. So thank you to all of you for your continued commitment, for your, your passion for working alongside young people in our community to break down barriers, to stop um, uh, polarizing um, individuals and prioritizing well-being in finding new ways of building belonging. The efforts uh, you're all putting here today to mobilize is one, a one system for children and youth well-being, and it inspires us at the region of Waterloo as we seek to grow with care. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and tomorrow's in-person gathering. And I am really pleased to be here. And I know it will be a wonderful um, afternoon. And Barb, will turn it back over to you. Karen, thank you so much. And thank you for those thoughtful words. We really do appreciate that. Um, yeah, we, are, we have a great afternoon ahead of us. Um, it's my privilege and honor to welcome Ashley Gallagos for our keynote on design principles for building belonging. Ashley is a belonging practitioner, a creator, a thought partner, and a facilitator. And she works with the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, focusing on the intersection of belonging research, application, and societal change. Ashley leads statewide strategies for belonging through the Places of Belonging program. She has co-authored educational materials such as the newly released Belonging Design Principles and Belonging, a weekly practice facilitator and practice guide, both that were designed to assist groups, entities, and organizations in advancing their belonging work. Engaging in thoughtful implementation of belonging, Ashley positively contributes to belonging initiatives across the US and beyond. And in her free time, she enjoys spending time with loved ones, building community, experiencing the arts, reading, being near the water and maintaining a spiritual groundedness. Um, and Ashley, I know we talked a little bit before the session and I just do want to warmly welcome you. I was saying to you that it's such a, perfect time for us to, at the children and youth planning table, we committed to belonging a few years ago now. And a lot of our work has focused on, or all our work focuses on belonging, but in certain specific channels. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to take a deep breath, ground ourselves back in thinking about belonging holistically and hearing from somebody who has really dedicated themselves to belonging to help us think and move our work forward. So please accept my really warm welcome to you. And um, if everyone could just join me in welcoming Ashley to this conversation. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. I could see the virtual claps and the emotions. Uh, thank you. I am uh, really happy to be here with each of you uh, and all of you collectively and to have um, your work very closely on my mind uh, as a strong anchor um, to, to delve into today's presentation and the discussion that I'll share about some of the work that I have uh, co-authored on the belonging design principles. 
And so I made a special request to start in gallery view um, for a number of reasons, um, but as a, as a fan and a deep practitioner of transparent facilitation, I thought I might share uh, why. Um, and as you'll see and um, hear a little bit more as I get into the more formal presentation here shortly, um, connection is a key point of belonging. And when we seek to create spaces where our goal, our stated goal is to design more spaces where more people feel like they belong, uh, it is important that we create avenues for people to opt into a point of connection. So I really appreciate how many people just turned on their cameras for even just a minute. I know that's a stretch. So thank you for, for giving in that way. Um, and what I, what I hope to do is just ask you as I do the same is to just take a look around, make eye contact with the people on the screen, with your colleagues, with your shared belonging ambassadors. They might not even know you are looking at them. And honestly, it's okay. <laughs> like the point is a, a human connection through this virtual medium. Um, I'm flipping through pages to see more of you. Uh, so beautiful. Hi, hello. And, um, and to those whose name I see or static photos I see know that I am uh, extending myself virtually and energetic to you all as well. Uh, so thank you for um, engaging in that with me. Um, there'll be moments of time together. My, my goal of this time is really to, to as ba Barb shared, like create a holistic virtual space for us together where we will be, I will be sharing um, through presentation and speaking about the belonging design principles, but really us cre uh, like collaboratively are gonna co-create this space. So right. I invite you to show up uh, as fully as you are able and willing for the next hour um, and some minutes together, both to show up with each other, with an open heart and mind to the content, um, but then also as really the true experts in your field, in your work, in your program, because what, what is gonna happen in this space together is I'm going to ask for your engagement to be holding your work in one part of your mind, um, not too tight, but just awareness of it while I present on the belonging design principles so that then you can bring them both together and you can uh, as an individually and then collectively think about spaces where these belonging design principles might invite you to further your work in particular areas, consider your work through a different lens, or you can come back to me and say, hey, Ashley, great presentation or, or you know, whatever you want to say. But, um, but actually, we found in our belonging work that you're, you're missing something in these principles that our community has found really valuable. And we are uh, seeing really good progress through advancing belonging in this particular way. So um, I just share that is that this is a space for um, engagement please do so to the way you see fit. While we will be muted, I, I do plan to bring in places in today's session where some voices will be able to be heard. Please use the reactions, please use the chat. Um, okay, so without further ado, I am going to get into the, um, the part of our time together that is, um, a more formal introduction of the belonging design principles. And just to share in advance that when we wrote these, um, we wrote them because belonging as a concept and as a practice is very big, very robust, and it's subjective, which means that each one of us has a different um, interpretation, a different reality, a different experience of belonging. And, and while that is true, there are also some things about belonging, some components of it that are true um, across the board. 
um, that our research has shown, that we have learned from communities, that we have learned from engaging with people. And so we wanted to provide a resource that would help um, provide a, a, a structure, an invitation into belonging. But we had the really big goal of making it um, kind of trans contextual. So it isn't just to say um, in Oakland, California, where I live in Embase, that this is what belonging looks like. It's to say, try this on in Canada. Try this on in Japan. Try this on in Europe. Try this in rural Kentucky. Let us know what it looks like, because at the end of the day, this is belonging is not something, it is not zero sum, it is not a competition. It is an invitation for us all to contribute in multiple ways to build a world where everyone belongs. So what I'm going to tailor our conversation to today is, um, is presenting these principles to you within the context of uh, the children and youth planning table, uh, recognizing that your, your connection to belonging is deep. And I wanna commend the work that the, that the steering committee has done, that the Waterloo region has done. Um, I spent a lot of time researching your area and the work that has been happening on belonging to prepare for this conversation. And I was sharing up front that my mind was a little bit blown about how many different ways you all have been considering the topic, working on it, working towards its implementation. And so I just view today's uh, conversation as this kind of regrounding, a regrouping, um, so that, and maybe even a little inspiration into where your work can go further um, together. So. I'm going to get myself together so that I can share my screen and, um, and start this presentation. Okie doke. So we are, we should be good. Can I see a thumbs for the present? Yes, okay, all right, wonderful. Um, so we're going to be talking about the transformative power of the belonging design principles. I truly believe that these um, that this um, these descriptions of belonging are transformative in a number of ways. And while I'll be introducing a high level um, description of each of the principles, I want you to know that a report exists. It's about nine pages. I'll share it with Allison, who can share it out if it's not already in the chat. But in your free time, you can sit with it a little bit further and read about the principles. And second, because there is a lot to cover in one day, this is not the only session you've been in. Um, this will be recorded so you can watch it again later. But then also, um, I'll share this with Allison to share later as well, is there is a learning module on belonging that we um, at the Institute offer, and it is uh, based on these belonging design principles. So you can take it in a more, um, you can receive the content in a more digestible way slowly and over time or share it with others uh, for free. But the course we're gonna go on today for the remainder of our time together is, um, well, the part we've just gone through where I introduce myself, the shape of our container for today and the, um, the belonging design principles as a whole. And then we're gonna get into two segments of a presentation. I'm gonna talk about um, the way we've kind of framed these principles. You'll see that there are 10, but they're broken down into two really big ideas that kind of anchor the rest of the principles. And then I'm going to talk about um, three through five of the principles that will make more sense a little in just a, a couple moments when I show you what they are. Um, and then we're going to engage in a small group discussion. Uh, this is also really important, especially as we um, consider concepts, consider practices together, that we hear a diverse range of thoughts, opinions, experiences on the concept. So we're going to have some breakouts or we're going to have a breakout to, to discuss that. And then we'll do kind of the same thing a second time, which is I'll come back and present uh, principles six through 10. And then we'll do a reflection kind of personally, a, a different form of reflection, um, but still to hear from one another. And then uh, my hope is to leave at least a few moments for question and answer, but also to recognize that these spaces 
are designed to create a little bit of flexibility, pliability, room for questions that may or may not be answered today. But part of the magic is to, to unearth, to raise the question up so that as a collective, you might start to explore them together after, after this session together. So the design principles. Um, as I shared briefly at the start, uh, we wrote this as like a, a how-to guide, how to design for belonging. Um, and it's full of considerations and essential components that have been both researched and learned um, from practitioners from uh, in so many geographic spaces. Um, so it has a, a wide range of perspectives in, included within it. And we consider this as an anchor for belonging initiatives. So when I'm working with groups, I, I use this tool in a number of ways. It can be used as an initial assessment of folks belonging work, or if they are just in the early paths of a commitment to belonging work, we can use that as, a, as almost a roadmap of elements that need to be considered when designing. Um, and if it's a program that's already in place, we might go through and identify where work is already happening. Say if there's work in three of the 10, then we would work together to say, okay, how might we expand it to about five areas out of the 10 that your initiative is specifically working on to advance. This is just a quick at a glance guide to let you know the path of where we're going. This, um, this grid is also avail available online. They're printable one pagers, very easy. I find them as helpful tools to keep in mind um, all 10 of the principles with just a quick glance. So I wanted to just show you that the resource does exist should you um, desire to download it uh, later. And then with all things, um, I just wanted to invite us, as I've shared a lot already, and as we um, are just on the cusp of me starting to unpack each of the design principles, to invite the room into a collective breath together. And so I'll breathe in and out. And I'll invite you in one time together to breathe in and breathe out as an invitation to just settle our bodies as we delve into some really rich content. So big idea number one. Um, the big idea, the first one, is that the root of the problem is othering. And we share this because othering is something that we are seeing happen across the globe. Othering is something just like belonging that operates at scales. So you can see it at societal levels. You can see it at nation levels. You can see it at, um, at state or particular jurisdiction areas, townships, cities. Uh, you can see it in systems, structures, groups, intergroups, and uh, interpersonally. And so I wanted to start out at kind of the, the, the fur, a further level than where we'll go uh, later as we refine in. But across the world right now, we're seeing a form of othering take place in the reduction of, um, of democracies, healthy democracies. And this map on this first slide is just showing a color orientation. So from green is a healthier democracy. And as it gets to the more red area, this is showing that uh, democracy is turning more towards um, a, an authoritarianism, uh, which is important to know and to, um, to just kind of have an eye on as we think about democracies uh, classically holding up the rights of the people, the voice of the people and implementing them into uh, policies and governance that works on behalf of people. Um, and we're seeing that kind of shift uh, in our world. So that's one thing we like to pin and, and have awareness of. Second piece is the uh, epidemic of loneliness. So the Surgeon General uh, here in the US in this year released this report that's shown on the screen showing that, um, that, the, that we're each experiencing loneliness and isolation to high and worrisome levels that is in fact um, a public health crisis, if you will. 
Um, and so we're feeling, it, even though we might be able to be connected through um, the internet or a more globalized society, we can meet people quicker from various parts of the world. Um, as a whole, we're seeing a shift of loneliness and isolation. And just as it was started in, within this session, uh, Waterloo is, is not different. I'm, I'm, as I was reading in the materials, uh, the sense of, of loneliness and some isolation in one of the reports I was reading, it was sharing that youth um, experience isolation at about a, a third, a third percent of the youth in Waterloo are feeling isolated and uh, one, four in 10 were feeling like not connected to their friends. And so just to bring it from like this global perspective down, like into the regional perspective is that loneliness and isolation um, is, is really happening uh, for many. And so I share the story of the meta story, what we see happening. So at a global scale, we see multiple changes happening all at once, which is true of uh, even the title of this gathering, coming together and changing times. Our times are continually changing and they're changing in big ways across the globe. They're changing in de demographics. Um, they're changing in relation to our climate. They're changing in relation to tech and what we have available to us, how tech might help or harm us um, and in globalization. And these are just like the big parts of change, right? That are happening generally in the background to our day-to-day. -day. These aren't the changes in our work scope, the changes in our neighborhood, the changes of our favorite restaurant closing or um, an economic standpoint, um, which all of these changes happening all at once. So the, us as humans, we're not necessarily prepared to, to take them all in at once with a steady, balanced mind. It, it, all these changes kind of unearth or un, they, they move the ground we are situated on and can lead to this lower bubble of an increase of anxiety within each of us, within our bodies, within our societies. And so it points over into this opportunity area. It's like, okay, so what do we need? You know, if this is our conditions, um, we need to be able to have uh, leadership. We need to have meta narrative. These are stories, the stories we tell, our visions of a, a future and structures that are equipping us with response mechanism, response strategies. So these three, the three um, kind of green bubbles on the on the perimeter of my right side um, are really these responses that we have available to us and, and some that I wanna encourage us towards. So the one at the top with the arrow that says breaking, um, pointing to the bubble that says fear, anger, and othering. So when we tell stories related to the change of demographics and tech and so forth, um, from a perspective of breaking and engagement of breaking, we're doing so out of fear of the other, we're doing so out of anger of the change. And this is a response, we, when we break, we say, we do not wanna engage with that other. We, um, there's something there that is not trustworthy, we don't want it, so we, we break with them. We don't do work together, we don't consider them, um, their perspective, uh, many things. Um, and, and we see this a lot. It causes, it's, it undergirds polarization. It undergirds fracturing, the fracturing of our times. Um, and so this is really, you know, it's abundant. Um, so our work is in the other side is like, how do we, how do we maybe turn away from the othering and the breaking and turn towards our opportunities of bridging and bonding? So I'm going to um, just quickly describe bonding, which is the, the lowermost bubble on the screen. This is where, this is a strategy um, where we get to know others, we're willing, uh, we know that breaking causes fragmentation or polarization, and we want to, to start connecting with people. And so we turn to those most like us, uh, we turn to those who maybe we've been a little bit separated from, but they definitely have similarities with us, maybe ideologically, religiously, um, they're in our, they're, they're our friends of our friends, you know, they're, they're in our network, so to speak. And so this is helpful, uh, it makes connections, but it's not, 
it's not ex expansive. It's not expanding who we know, what we know, what our worlds look like and really opening up to the change. So the, the, real, the real area of work is in bridging. Um, within, when we are bridging, we are practicing empathy, inclusion, and, and working towards belonging. And we are intentionally willing to put ourselves out there to learn about one another across lines of difference, which we know there are many, um, but we are open to the exploration. And we uh, consider ourselves as someone who is willing to bridge, someone um, who, is, who is willing to put the effort in to both share about ourselves, but also to get to know one another uh, in a more meaningful way. So you can see, um, we can see that othering um, happens across the world. It happens across multiple, um, multiple expressions of identity. The bubbles on this screen are just a, a, a small, a small expression of, of, of identity traits that folks are commonly othered on or that we might other um, people for, for being, for having. Um, and, and really the bottom is just saying that othering is not, othering is a common, it's generalized set of common processes that engender marginality and group-based inequality across a full range of human dis, um, differences. So this is just saying, no matter the uh, identity, um, whether it's your nationality, sexual orientation, political affiliation, race, gender, ability, or other, there are a common set of processes that we see happening. And you can read much more about this within the report and in a specific report um, that the Institute provides, it's fully describing othering. But the main point of this is to know that othering does exist and it exists in relationship with belonging. So I could not start a uh, presentation on belonging without talking about othering because they are deeply, deeply connected. So the second um, big idea is that everyone belongs. And um, with this, uh, we view belonging as being universal. This means that it's not contingent upon how you show up, any of the identities that you hold. It is in fact a right that was given to each and every one of us at birth. Uh, so starting even from there is a different frame, is a different positionality towards, you know, everyone, absolutely everyone belonging. And as Barb started the call, um, encouraging us to think about and remember the sacredness of children, but then also uh, gracefully expanded the idea to the sacredness of humanity. This is kind of getting in, a, this is in alignment with that is what if we approached everyone with this sacredness and an honoring of the, the, the thing in them and in us that makes us human and then building programs, um, structures that support and help them uh, express their most full, fullest self and, and fully belong. Um, and so then we get into belonging as a topic, it just being a compound topic, that means it has many parts. And I know you know that. And um, what these principles, the remaining principles will do is just explain some of the key parts that kind of uh, rose to the top. But I also just wanna share that belonging is flexible. Uh, it is not static. And I think one of the hardest things about creating a definition of belonging, if you will, or even a description of belonging is that it, it's not to say it is a, it's still in a static point. It is always subjective and it, it, it requires flexibility in its design, in our minds, in our thinking, in our engagement when we are working with it. One thing I hear pretty con like uh, regularly is that um, belonging belonging has this power of being fully aspirational. It's a world we want to build for everybody. Um, and and <laughs> some people will say, okay, uh, it, it's aspirational. You know, <laughs> that that's as good. That's that's good, but it's not it's not practical. Um, and I would offer kind of this balance of well. Yes, it is aspirational. It, it is a vision. It is a dream. It is something we reach towards as a society, as a world. 
as the invitation it offers, but it's also practical in the sense that, you know, the world is constructed and we are part of it and we can decide and determine what uh, the, and, and contribute to the world we want to build. And so the invitation on the practical side is not to just let it stay aspirational, but to really engage in the work of, of making it practical and personal. Um, and so then the last piece, which we'll get into a little bit more is that belonging is a feeling that arises in each of us, um, but that it's also structurally supported. Um, supported or denied. So those are the two big, um, the big ideas that frame the rest of them. Um, so the rest of the principles. So I just share those up front with you and ask you to hold that context of, of what exists as we go into the remaining eight principles of, okay, what is included? Oh, yes, yes, I, I did. Sorry, I forgot I added this. Um, so um, this is just to quickly reference that belonging is not a new concept. It, it, it dates back to uh, like past anything represented on this slide, but two key focal areas I wanted to point out from this slide is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, belonging uh, rooted right in the center of what humans need um, for, for safety and motivation. Uh, and then also uh, referencing Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's work in a beloved community um, and that what he was anchoring within the movement of civil rights uh, within the US context and, and globally is a call for belonging and viewing each other's humanity across difference. And, and this is really um, building from the legacy that um, both, of, both of these points of reference build from. We can see that over time, um, we can see that over time there has been structures and systems that have done the work of exclusion, right? This is a, the gray circle is like a structure or system with the uh, people who are excluded kind of on the exterior of it, moving in visually to inclusion where the structure, those gray dots kind of stay exactly the same in the same shape and mold. Um, but the, the people, the, the dots, if you will, are allowed in they have to stay within a particular shape to be included. And to what we're offering, what we're thinking about when we design for belonging is really expansive, new shapes, new distribution. You can almost like, there's a remnants of the, of the uh, original shape, but it's, it's taken a whole new life and form and is uh, co-created. And so just visually, this is a slide that we like to use to describe uh, belonging. And because I'm a fan of art and it's deeply a part of, of work and building for belonging, I just wanted to share that um, uh, these two as an offering of like a sense of belonging, what it feels like, and then also its structural component that belonging can be tangibly built. And you'll see that I designed for pauses because there's a lot of content. And when there's a lot of content, we have to check in with ourselves and our bodies, not to just let the important pieces kind of flow out as the new next content rolls in. And so I just wanted to build in a pause for you to check in, to ground on the, um, on the big ideas that we've shared so far before we move into the rest of the principles. And I'm gonna move in now. So the third, three of 10, prioritize structural change. We put prioritize structural change in a third, third kind of place. They're not ordered. The principles are not ordered as far as like what you need to do in sequence. They all work together, they're interconnected, but uh, numerically we wanted to present this pretty high up uh, because uh, we saw it, much of the work that has been done in the research of belonging has focused over time on the feeling of belonging. 
and less so on the structural importance and transformation that belonging offers us. And so I wanted to move this up to a, we wanted to move it up to a higher level, just to say that structures do work within our societies. They're not neutral. They can do the work of exclusion if they're built to do that. They can do the work of inclusion and they can do the work of belonging. Um, but within that, uh, we it's also important to recognize that each of us have relationships to the structures that are different um, based on our own context, our history, where we come from, um, and, and the power that we hold within all of that. And so just wanted to note that the situatedness of each person is really important to be considering when you're working on changing structures, because it won't be just equal changes. You do have to consider and build equitably um, within system and structural changes. And again, this is just an image to show, uh, the far image shows a structure being built, um, but doing the work of exclusion for uh, if the job is to move a person up this escalator and the person is in a wheelchair who cannot go up that specific um, device to get to get up to the next floor, then whether or not the structure intended it, it it's doing the work of exclusion. Um, and so it, we've got some work to do to rebuild, to have greater inclusion and to have more belonging within the systems and structures. Uh, the, other, the other images just uh, illustrate that sometimes structures, the middle image is showing that sometimes structures are helpful at one point. Uh, we've learned how they might be harmful in current times and we need space to imagine a space of what these systems, how they can work uh, to be different, to be reconstructed. Um, and so I just thought it was beautiful of this person painting um, such a beautiful, new, different um, way of, of structures doing work. Four, power dynamics. So you all are um, familiar with this. I saw this noted in your description and your work around belonging too, is to pay particular uh, attention to the power dynamics of adults and young, young people and, and, and children, recognizing that they're there and doing work to account for them. Um, when we're talking about power dynamics within the design principles, it's really, we're using power as the ability to achieve one's purpose. And we're, we're rooting in the fact that power exists within each of us. We have, we have power, um, structures have power, and also our stories have power. And with particular emphasis of whose story is being told, how are we telling stories, um, and, and, and considering them and building them in rich and dynamic ways that address historical power imbalances, shifting of power, um, that is required for building for belonging. And I think one point that I want to mention from this slide in particular is that generally when folks are, when groups are starting to talk about power, they ask where to, where to start. It's a sticky, uh, it's a sticky topic sometimes. And um, one, I'd say approach it with curiosity. To approach it with a willingness of transparency, you know, a uh, first way to start is generally about like talking about organizational structure, how does it exist, what, how are decisions made and kind of bringing up these pieces that can be almost invincible, uh, invisible, the way uh, a system or a structure operates, and then bring them up for people to know uh, what they are and have an opportunity to consider them or contribute to them and or transform them, change them one day. And so five, uh, this one is foster agency and inclusive co-creation. This is a big one, especially uh, in relation to ship to belonging. This is saying that agency, so I have um, agency to be able to contribute. I have agency and an ability for my voice to be heard. I also saw this through your work on belonging and sharing that um, young people would have the ability to be seen and heard. And I don't know if it went as far to be like uh, responded to, but I think this is the call of the of co-creation as well as you, you value the input, the voice of all people at the table um, and, and you shape the space actively together. 
So when I think about agency and co-creation, I think of them as kind of a, a spectrum, and this is always continuing to work in my mind. So please accept it for what it is today, but um, and with you, how it lands with you. Um, but I think of agency often as something I individually can contribute to, my individual expression, how I might lean into um, what my ability is to, to use my voice and to vocalize um, my ideas or points of, of difference um, in ideas to how we shape rules or governance or something fun like a party or celebration, however it is that I use my ideas to share with the group. And then co-create, like it, if, if agency is this individual side that I contribute to, and we're looking at a spectrum, then co-creation is this furthest end that says, okay, from here, every person is, is welcome in it and included in expressing their own individual contributions and agency. But together in this co-creative process, no one voice is larger than the collective. We take the time to hear the collective voices and expressions of agency. And we all build together from each other's points of perspective and ideas being considered and built for. Um, and so co-creation is this really beautiful um, offering where uh, we are truly working together across difference to build for belonging. Some examples um, that I just posted about uh, co-creation. So good, good ones that I love are just listening sessions to hear people's voice, um, but then also to prepare to do something with what you've heard from people. Uh, designing engagements to be more inclusive, points of points of interaction with one another, points of connection, points of um, I don't know, just time to sit and listen to one another. I also said this a little bit earlier, but naming the process, naming for people what they can expect, um, having time for reflection and adjustment. And that um, the last point that I make on here and with any of this is that co-creation, expressions of agency is just like belonging when I was saying it's flexible, it is continual and it's not static. Um, even while we and organizations have a responsible a responsibility of creating some shape to it and making it transparent, all of these practices are are new. They're different. We're we're trying them on. In essence, we're having these small micro experiments, social experiments with each other, where our feedback is the greatest asset back to what we put forward. So I just share again that even with co creation, the the call is really to maintain flexibility uh, as we work together through this new um, and different space, really, if we're honest uh, about how like the structures exist at present to what co-creation offers, it's a, it's a different way of being together. Um, so taking note of that and that we're really committed to trying it. Okay. So I've said a lot. I'm going to just um, stop sharing for a moment, yeah, even though, don't worry, this is where we're going, but I'm going to drop it in the chat. I'm going to just um, stop so that I can come back to each of you. And I'm going to share a little bit that, yes, where we are going is into breakouts. This is where I would really love for each of you to step into the agency and the co-responsibility that we have with one another, just to, to share your thoughts in response to the prompt I'm about to drop into the chat. Um, and it's really just thinking about your work, the structure you work within, and where an area of change is. And so um, it will not be a facilitated space. You're going to go in there together. It will only be 10 minutes. So I ask for you to just kind of jump in with a willingness. You have about a minute and a half each for discussion. So please stick to that on our time with one another. Um, and then the next person, jump in, share your thoughts. Um, Allison and team are going to be dropping in a Google Doc within to the um, chat. And so I just ask for one representative from each group to, to open the Google Doc. 
and to please volunteer to just take some high level notes of the discussion. It's not to capture everything that was discussed, but you are talking about structural change and it is an opportunity that you have to potentially make some of those changes together. So we wanna be sure to just capture the ideas that are generated from the conversation. So I am going to drop this into the chat. This is just the prompt. Um, and I don't think that will go with you. So um, someone might just copy and paste it so that you have it available. Um, yeah, and so you're gonna be in groups of five for 10 minutes discussing this prompt, um, one note taker within the Google Doc and everybody contributing. So uh, thank you and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, so embrace, number six, embrace mutual responsibility. Let's see. So um, it's self-explanatory, right? So mutual responsibility. Each of us have a, a responsibility of contribution. We are in exchange. I love the work that this image, the artwork does. It's just like flow flowing fluid exchange, at least to my mind, that is being represented. And that's really the work of, of a mutual responsibility, a mutual engagement um, that we um, have ourselves, our space of expression, but also we are creating space to hear from others and, and not just to hear, but to have responsibility with one another. Um, each of us is a contributor to the way we create and hold space together, you know, and the way we show up has a, a very important impact. If we are um, not feeling well, or we're feeling upset or angry, and we're bringing that kind of into this space, yes, that we can work through that, but like, we can't deny that we're bringing in the charge that we're bringing into the conversation, that it is contributing in a way that we are uh, whole, we are offering to the group um, some tension points, you know, maybe then the invitation is to work out together responsibly, but um, it's really just to say each of us is contributing to the whole, to have awareness of how we're contributing and to have responsibility for how we show up, what we give and accountability for what is given back, um, uh, back to us. It is a continual space of giving and, and learning when we are working towards belonging and in relationship with one another. So design uh, principle seven is to celebrate and value diversity. Um, I think this is really uh, beautiful. It's just a reminder, as I was saying at the start, that like uh, belonging is universal. And within that, it does not mean that each of us has to be the same. We're not saming. We're not like fitting a mold of what who we have to be or what we have to be to belong. As I said at the start of the call and within the context of this is that belonging is contingent, um, not based on how we show up. And this is where we start to see it kind of unpacked through the multiple diversities that each of us hold and that the, the invitation of belonging is not to be the same, but instead to create spaces where our diverse personhood characteristics, attributes are able to come through and shine fully and be respected uh, and celebrated, celebrating one another and our differences. Um, and, and again, you'll see equity even through this celebrate and value diversity is that we have we have, um, we have been historically excluded or marginalized and have very different stories from one another. And so uh, the way we approach valuing diversity or celebrating one another, we might have to uh, get more creative in how we, how we do that um, and, and recognize that, that people may need different types of support or different ways of being valued, different ways of feeling celebrated and that it's an important part for us all to have an ear towards listening to the ways people want to be celebrated, the way um, uh, they value space being created for diversity to, to, sh to shine and to work through. And so really moving on what you hear from each other without assumptions on, on how people want to be celebrated. So 
Um, that's really important. I will say the one thing on this, that's not on this slide too, is like, when, when I talk about celebrating and I invite you all into it, it it's, it's like celebrating in the biggest, fullest way together, you know, like, uh, and being sure to design a celebration also with care for one another in, in a myriad of ways. And I think one of the most fun experiments on this is to co-create a party and ask everybody for their contributions of what does it look like? What type of music is there? What type of food is there? Um, are, are we talking? Are we not talking? You know, uh, what are we doing at this party? And also, how do we share in the responsibility for setup, for cleanup, for all the things in between? And so that it does become more of a, a fully more comprehensive co-created experience, starting at something that is like kind of on the smaller scale of things we can do. Um, but, but to do it in a big, robust way, like to celebrate, authentically see each other and really be there with one another. It's beautiful. So prioritizing and valuing relationships. So um, this is, we were talking about this through the structural components too, of like what it looks like to prioritize this, this necessity of building relationships, valuing relationships. We create time for them, we create, create space for them. We create, a, we offer a givingness of ourselves and a receiving of others so that we can deepen and we can form relationships and then we can deepen in relationships because these are definitely necessary. This li links over to the bridging I was talking about at the very start of our time together. Um, but it, it, it relies on the fact that relationships are important, uh, that we need each other, and that when we approach times of change or times of conflict, it is in fact those relationships that we built, that we lean towards, that we rely on to help us get through together. And so um, prioritizing, prioritizing and valuing relationships helps kind of create a safety rails, a, a net, you know, for us to go through these continual changes together um, and, and to move through conflicts, which conflicts are going to happen. They're inevitable and can be healthy. Um, and so in a way, we're building relationships to move through those tough times together in a way that supports each of our continual well-being. Um, and this is also recognizing that, you know, we can break, we can fracture, but that doesn't ultimately lead to the change we want if the change we want is uh, building for belonging for everyone. We recognize that even the people who upset us or have different visions than us, um, that their humanity is still valuable, that they are a part of the community and that uh, building with them is, is important. Number nine. Uh, recognizing that identities are multifaceted and dynamic. When I think about working with children and youth, um, and also when I hear from children and youth, this this seemed th their wisdom, their knowledge on identities and and um, the way identities are fluid and in motion um, is like some of I learned so much from them um, while also recognizing that this you like youth, they're in a very important stage in their ide identity formation and that adults have a responsibility for creating a safer space for them to kind of explore that part of themselves, the pieces of themselves that are coming into formation. Um, and so this slide is just a recognition that all of us hold identities that are multifaceted and dynamic. And that uh, rigid identity, a static identity, if we, if we um, hold on to, to ourselves just having one, it indeed like flattens ourselves and limits our potential of what we can be. And so the invitation of belonging is to have some flexibility of mind when it comes to identity and recognizing even in practice with ourselves, we ourselves are not the same person we were when we were um, five years old. We're not the same person we were when we were 16 or 24 or 40. And we're not certainly the same person we will be at 72 or beyond. You know, we are changing our ideas, our understanding, our expressions, our world, our response to our world. It's all in continual motion. Um, 
And so we just share this as like not to have our identities be such a static contributor to developing for belonging. Um, our positions can sometimes get a little bit rigid around static identities. So it's just really a, a note to say, don't let the way you view yourself or others to become static um, or kind of trapped, if you will allow curiosity to do this kind of expansive work as other people explore more who they are in this moment. And we explore who we are and who we are together, how we come together and meet the opportunity of, of building a world for each of us um, together. And 10, the final one, which is never final because it kind of just like keeps on moving through. Um, but I, so I thought it was wise to end with interconnection is because these, while listed numerically, they're interwoven, they are deeply connected uh, to one another, just like we are. Um, no one person, which I hope you've gathered through this presentation is really a, a foundation to, to building for belonging is that no one of us can do this alone. Uh, no one individual, no one entity, no one um, no one place. We're not islands. We are we are deeply connected. The actions that we engage in can change the the dynamics of a team. As I was illustrating earlier, what we bring in has the power to either, you know, uplift the room, provide inspiration or insight, or it can kind of bring it down or or stir up um, tensions. We can work through them nonetheless, but just to have awareness of, of how we can impact the work that is happening, having some responsibility for that. Um, and that that even through that, like there's an there's an interconnection of how we as an individual show up, how we as a group do our work, and what that work is and the impact on the region of how we're trying to um, create and advance change. Um, and I think this this last piece, um, this last piece about being wired to exist in relationship always strikes me. My uh, co-author, Cecily Saraski, she she was talking to me about this piece is that we're, we're co-wired to exist within relationships, that we were, we were brought onto this earth in direct connection to another human. And even though that connection was severed, um, we are still connected and reliant on one another. While it might appear that we can operate as a single entity or that we're self-sustaining or uh, any of those illusions, we really need one another. And um, our problems and our solutions can all be based in relationships. So our problems, if we, if we break or we see others as a problem, they will perpetuate in that way. But if we step into solutions based on recognizing that relationships really help us get through um, get through the problems and to create solutions and we'll be much better for it. So I'm going to stay at this and just um, kind of take a, a little breath. Um, we've gone through a little breath and a recognition that we've gone through 10 design principles together, which are really rich topic areas. Um, so I want to thank you in a big way for, for receiving all of that information in, um, in a short period of time. And then I'm moving into this prompt, our next prompt together, um, just so that you can see it while I get my screen together to come back um, to gallery view, which I am going to do now. And I'm going to share with you that um, for this one, for this moment, for this, um, the way I've designed this part of expression is we're going to do this um, here together in the room. We're not going to go into breakouts. I'm dropping the prompt within the chat so that you can all see it. But this is asking us how we individually or how children and youth planning table collectively can further belonging work in prioritizing relationships or bridging across differences? And so um, what we'll do here is I'm just, we're just gonna take a minute, a minute and a half uh, in our own stillness within our own mind. And we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to sit with this question. And when an answer arises, so please either uh, write it down so that you have it 
but also if you feel inclined, type it into the chat so that we can collectively uh, sit and view the responses together. So um, just for a minute, minute and a half, I'm gonna stay quiet and invite you into your own thoughts and reflection to the prompt in the chat. You don't have to wait. Also, if the idea came to you and you've typed it out, please, uh, you are welcome to enter it into the chat anytime. is where I'm, I'm looking forward to reading what you type in here. I described this to Allison as a chat waterfall uh, where one drop of water has not yet fallen. Uh, so I hope that you'll please contribute so that we can uh, create this um, thought exchange. Uh, yes, here we go. Thank you, Allison. Which as I share it, I realize will make less sense to people that if they were not in this morning's conversation where we were talking about um, the different ways in which CYPT works. But Ashley, for you, at least, we were looking at different activities and people were into a forced choice decision where they could only hold on to a, a certain small number of activities. And I thought it was interesting in our conversation in our room the one that was on, you know, that convening and bringing us humans together um, was something that they thought was important, but they weren't going to choose it for their top five because it's like, it's a given, like it has to happen. It's part of the CYPT and like how we work, like the relationship, being in relationship and being together is, is the CYPT. So anyway, whether or not it was a fit to pick or not, that's a different conversation. But I do think as we think about your prompt there, like how do we further working and on prioritizing relationships, not losing sight, I guess, to that inherentness of like what we are when we come together in yes. terms of working and connection with each other is pretty important. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Okay. Here we go. These are the, and these responses are coming. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to read a little bit from what Jillian had shared here, creating connection and opportunities for each group and individual to understand how our lo understand our own location and feel comfortable building bridges between groups and other identities and celebrating all identities together. Yes, I love that. I love that and look forward to seeing your work on that. Um, let's see, from Laura, she uh, shares listening and learning about community strengths and needs prior to planning actions and interventions to ensure actions reflect the community's actual needs. Yes, and making extra effort to hear voices of those less frequently heard. All right now, all right. Um, I'm gonna read one more coming in from Pamela. Connecting with other is, it, uh, sorry, the, the, another one came in. Connecting with others is so valuable 
and becoming comfortable with other agencies, we can all grow. Yes, yes. And the interconnection of our efforts and works together. Like I recognize it takes more work up front to build connections from your program, your agency to another agency. Um, but like that is the network that is required. And that's the like relational building we have to prioritize time for. So I'm so happy you um, pulled that out and, and built for it. Yes. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes and I'm so, I just want to um, say that I am very thankful for the opportunity to spend this time uh, with you all and sharing the work of the, or sharing an introduction of the belonging design principles with you. As I shared at the start of the call, they were written and are designed as an invitation for consideration. Um, and so I do hope that you'll take that invitation uh, and you have really today, but in your follow-up work um, together or individually on uh, what it can look like to use them further um, in your work or um, sometimes what is it like a finessing of the work that you have? Like how do we prioritize relationships or if it's something we do intrinsically, should we state that like because so that we never lose sight of that and that we focus on how we create the space together um, so that other when others know that when they come to a children and youth planning table event, they experience something in their body that lets them know they're with us in this group that holds each other sacred. And so, um, yeah, that's a big invitation, but I um I thank you all for the time together. I thank you for the invitation of having me here and allowing me to uh, present on, on the work, on the work. So 